Hey guys, how you doing? This is Professor Garcia again. I'm doing an online lecture on ostomy care. Um, in this lesson, we will learn the types of ostomies, um, why they're placed, uh, how to assess them, and uh, some pre-op and some post-op um, considerations. So what is an ostomy? An ostomy is an opening for the gastrointestinal urinary or respiratory tract on the skin. So sometimes you might have seen a um, a stoma brought out for the bladder where they can self-cath. Um, so ostomies are not always a piece of intestine. They can be parts of the bladder um, and uh, or the respiratory tract on the skin, such as a you know a stoma of the of the trach. There are many types of GI ostomies. The purpose of the bowel ostomy is to divert and drain fecal material. They are often classified by their status, permanent or temporary, their anatomical location, and the const uh, construction of the stoma. So we have a gastrostomy, a eugenostomy, ileostomy, and colostomy. Depending on where they are at in the large or small bowel, it will determine whether the consistency will be runny or the color, the consistency. Um, the closer that you get through the the bells and towards the end, towards the um, descending sigmoid and, and rectum, then you're going to see more formed uh, fecal output. Uh, so the stoma, the stoma is the opening created in the abdominal wall by the ostomy, and it's brought through the abdominal wall and secured to the stomach, the out, the outer stomach or or um, skin with sutures that you would see, and that's also something else that we're gonna we would assess as nurses. The stoma has to be generally red in color and moist, okay? So if it's um, uh, pink to, to red, and it shouldn't be like bluish or purple or anything like that, or dark in color, okay? Initially, slight bleeding can occur when touched, and this can be considered normal, especially immediately after surgery. Uh, no nerve endings are in the stoma, so typically it doesn't hurt, but the peri area, the area around the um, stoma, can be sensitive still though. So why do we get, why do we give people ostomies? Um, ostomies uh, surgery of the bell, also known as a bell diversion, refers to the surgical procedures that reroute the normal movement of intestinal contents out of the body when part of the bell is diseased or removed. Uh, this happens a lot for uh, cancerous tumors, for um, uh, inflamed areas, diseased parts of the bell. Um, other things of that nature. A person may need ostomy surgery of the bell if he or she has cancers of the colon or rectum, an injury to the small or large intestine, inflammatory bowel disease. And the IBS or inflammatory bowel syndrome is an umbrella term again that includes a lot of things such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and, um, and some other disorders that either will affect uh, the entire lining of the intestinal wall or just part of the intestinal wall. Uh, it can be due to an obstruction, a blockage in the bell that prevents the flow of the fluids or solid, diverticulitis, which is uh, instances of inflammation in the pockets that form in the bell um, due to bacteria and sometimes seeds get in there, other things get in there and cause inflammation. Uh, diverticulitis specifically is a condition that occurs when small pouches in the colon called diverticuli become inflamed or irritated and swollen and infected. Ostomies can be either temporary or permanent. Um, remember when we were talking about small bowel obstructions that uh, if they're partial obstructions or full obstructions will determine whether they're most likely going to need some sort of surgical intervention. Partial uh, Partial obstructions, more than 85%, usually resolve on their own, where, uh, you know, that small percentage need, might need a uh, surgical intervention or an ostomy placed. Uh, the ostomies themselves are temporary, usually when traumatic injuries or inflammatory conditions of the bell. Um, they allow for the distal disease portion of the bell to rest and heal. So if we're thinking like a diverticulitis, a temporary instance of disease or inflammation. The permanent... Uh, bell uh, are, are uh, typically they're permanent the ostomies are permanent to provide a means of elimination when the rectum or anus is non-functional as a result of birth defects or cancer 
So location, location, location. And this is a great diagram to show like depending on. So this is the large bell. And you have um, different areas where it can be. And you can have multiple uh, different types of ostomies that protrude. You can have dual and, um, and some other things that we'll talk about in just a bit. But as you can see, uh, we have the ascending colon, colon, right? Coming from the small intestine to the ascending colon. We've got the appendix down here in the cecum, right? We have the transverse colon, colon, and then we have descending colon. We have an ileostomy right here in the ileum in the cecostomy, sigmoidostomy. So location influences the character and management of fecal drainage, like I was alluding to earlier. Uh, depending where it is located will determine whether um, the consistency and the and the output, the way it looks and the way it um, presents. The farther along the bell, the more form the stool will be and the more control over the frequency of fecal discharge can be established. So if it's in the um, an ileostomy right here, uh, produces liquid fecal drainage and cannot be regulated. Okay, so um, the closer that you get towards the end too, you, the patient may be able to uh, regulate it in terms of when they put it out. Where out here, you're more uh, prone to just peristalsis and it's going to come out when it comes out. Um, so the ileostomy contains some digestive enzymes which can be can damage the skin. So that's be when we when we uh, put on a new wafer, uh, which is the adhesive part or the base of the ostomy pouch, we have to measure it uh, pretty accurately, and, and and it really allows for only an eighth of an inch uh, of exposed skin around the stoma. Otherwise, if there's like you know you cut the wafer, the the adhesive pouch, I mean the adhesive um, base too too wide, you're exposing too much good skin around the stoma, the the fecal output, and the, especially if they contain digestive enzymes, which are enzymes that are designed to break things down, will eventually break down the skin surrounding the stoma. So we want to avoid that. Um, we must always wear appliance, uh, must always wear appliance and watch for skin breakdown. Odor is minimal. So the priority with those kind of things is skin breakdown. On the ascending colon, which is over here, uh, drainage is liquid and cannot be regulated. Contains some digestive enzymes, but odor is a problem. Uh, transverse colon, right here, produces malodorous, mushy drainage. Some liquid has been reabsorbed and there's still no control. The descending colon or descending colostomy increases solid output and some control. The uh, sigmoidostomy, and this is like the uh, the part close to the um, the closest to the rectum here. Obviously, you'll have some uh, control or total control, and you'll have fully formed output, and may not have to wear an appliance. So, a lot of times, if there's a um, a cancer or a tumor or something, and they want it, and it's around the sigmoid and below, they can uh, perform an anastomosis or a resection by cutting out the diseased tumor, reattaching the um, the bowel together because there is uh, quite a bit of elasticity to it. And a lot of times they don't have to, these patients may not have to have an ostomy at all because um, it's so far at the end that they usually, uh, the peristalsis above has, is enough to push this through through the rectum. So what types of surgeries are there? And, and again, when I say the stoma, here's the bell being pulled through the, the abdominal cavity here. Okay, so you have different, you have a dual kind of stoma. You have um, areas where uh, you have a resection. So like a colon resection is a portion of the colon with tumor where the tumor is excised and two ends of the bell irrigated and then anastomos, anastomized. Or reattached. If bell is inflamed or bell unable to be anastomized, then col um, colostomy is created. So basically, you know, again, like let's say they cut out this diseased part and these two things came together under the abdominal wall and, you know, functioned properly, then there wouldn't be no need for an outpouching or a stoma to be created or an ostomy to be created. Uh, a loop colostomy 
is a loop of bell, is brought out into the abdominal wall and supported by a plastic bridge or a piece of rubber tubing. It is sutured to the abdominal wall, usually temporary and usually in transverse colon. So the end stoma, usually in descending or sigmoid colon when colostomy intended to be permanent. Distal stump can be preserved in the abdominal cavity for later reattachment. So that means like, so let, let's say like they pull this loop here and then they'll suture this one out and just keep it in there just in case later these will these two ends will be attached. The double barrel stoma. So you got double barrel stomas here. Created by dividing bowel and bridging, uh, bringing both proximal and distal end to the abdominal surface to create a two stoma uh, output or pouching. Least common is the proximal stoma is functional, eliminates stool and distal stoma, non-functional, may produce mucus. So how do we prep these people? How do we get them, um, get them prepared for surgery to do this kind of surgery? Well, we have to re reinforce the explanation of plan and procedure. Um, if ostomy is planned, have certified wound ostomy continence nurse or CWOCN consult the patient. Why would we do this? Well, we'd want that subject matter expert to come in and use the proper scripting and verbiage when they, when they can tell this patient what to expect afterwards because there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, psychosocial uh, issues that would arise in terms of um, self-image and, and other things of that nature. Uh, some low rectal surgeries may have sexual dysfunction and urinary incontinence as a result of ner nerve damage during surgery. So it's it's important that the CWOCNs come and explain all that. Um, we want to check labs and diagnostic studies prior to procedure. We want to definitely have them do a bowel cleanse where typically they'll um, they'll drink some sort of solution that will cause them to, um, you know, stool softener or, or rather um, uh, a bowel cleanse essentially that they drink and uh the night the night prior that they'll be able to um uh you know just evacuate everything that's in there um in addition they're going to want to be npo typically after midnight um but you want to do this bowel cleanse to minimize bacterial growth and prevent complications because if there's fecal matter in the intestines that they're um performing surgery on definitely all that waste is a, a harboring area for bacteria and it's just a vehicle for bacteria. Uh, so pre-oral or IV anti antibiotics prophylactically, obviously, because the risk for infection is there. Um, we and definitely NPO, like I said, and that's typically eight hours prior to procedure. So once they're recovered, what's what's you know what do we have to consider in terms of post-op? Well, typically they'll have an NG tube, and I want you to check on page 1159 the care of patient with the NG tube and what that entails. Um, we definitely want to do that um, for decompression because when they go do these things, they fill the stomach with CO2. A lot of times this is laparoscopic, um, but, uh, but still they, in order to do this and uh, visualize everything clearly and, um, and you know, just so there's no complications, they inject the abdominal cavity with CO2. Um, a lot of times the patient will have an IV um, patient controlled analgesic for the first 24 to 36 hours. Uh, after the NG is removed, slowly uh, they'll move from liquids to solids. Um, they may return with clear ostomy pouch or petroleum gauze to keep stoma moist, okay? So we want to keep the stoma moist and, uh, and promote healing there. And then it will be covered with a dry sterile dressing, but first and foremost it has to have that petroleum gauze or um, uh, ostomy pouch with petroleum gauze. Uh, you want to place a pouch system as soon as possible with the CWOCN to train these individuals on how to do it because for the most part these are um, worn for, for periods of time and you know they, you want to ensure that this patient understands what's going on, that they're in the right state of mind to receive that instruction and that they give a competent demonstration. The stoma should be reddish pink with some initial edema is normal. Some bleeding may occur. Stoma should start functioning two to three days post-op. So if the patient was asking you, hey, I'm not having very much output, I'm having very, like, this mucusy stuff or, or some bleeding, you know, you could tell them, well, that's actually normal following the procedure. 
and, and you can expect this um, thing to start functioning two to three days after. Um, you want to empty the pouch frequently, especially uh, you want to do it when it's uh, half to one third full because any more than that, then it's it becomes heavy and it can uh, really jeopardize the integrity of the um, the wafer, which is essentially just a sticker. And we know that surface skin uh, sloughs off and reproduces. So, you know, you would have some um, de not dehiscence, but rather just um, peeling away of that wafer. Um, also, we want to empty it when it's like that because chances are um, the higher up it gets in the bag in terms of fecal matter, the, cl the, the more likely it is to touch that good skin surrounding the stoma and it'll start breaking down that skin. Um, the output may be liquid feces immediately after surgery, but should thicken up depending on where ostomy is created. So again, um, depending on where the ostomy is created, we want to be able to educate, you know, this individual who says, hey, my my output is like water and you and you just say well um you can you can uh, expect it to be like that for a little bit but then it'll thicken up um especially if it's on the descending colon sigmoid etc you know um they may have jp drains if other surgical incisions were created uh, to in order and then and then um so definitely we want to our, our priority for these individuals is uh viability of the stoma just doing that uh, ostomy care, emptying the pouch, skin breakdown. But then again, the worst thing that can happen to this individual is that possibly there was an opening into the peritoneal cavity and some of the feces is getting in there and causing an infection, which would lead to peritonitis. Okay, so remember the classic signs and symptoms of peritonitis and what can happen and how it can lead to shock and eventual death if we don't act quick. So again, let's just go over those complications. Skin irritation is the most common complication for people with an ostomy. Uh, stoma problems like hernia, prolapse, or narrowing of the stoma. Blockage if the stoma has not passed intestinal content or stool for four to six hours and the person is experiencing cramping or nausea, we need to immediately let somebody know. Okay? Uh, and when I say immediately let, let somebody know, we mean that physician. Uh, diarrhea. Person has diarrhea if he or she passes loose stool three or more times a day. Um, however, again, like depending if it's closer to the ileum or the small bowel, then we're going to see uh, liquid-like drainage and no control of that. So it possibly is not diarrhea in that sense. Uh, we may see bleeding uh, days afterwards, which would constitute a... Um, um, you know, a call out to the doctor. Electrolyte imbalances, definitely. Infection is one of our main ones, especially not only just infection of the the surgical site and, and stoma, but rather of the um, abdominal cavity, which again would lead to peritonitis. Uh, irritation of the internal pouch or pouchitis. Vitamin B12 deficiency may affect vitamin B12 absorption from food and result in a gradual drop in vitamin B12 levels in the body. Low le levels of vitamin B12 can affect the body's ability to use nutrients and may cause anemia. Uh, phantom rectum pain. So sometimes you'll have phantom rectum pain and um, some mucusy discharge from the rectum still, um, even though that uh, they're still having output out of the ostomy pouch. Uh, short bell syndrome and again rectal discharge. Ileostomy or colostomy whose lower colon, rectum, and anus are still uh, pre present may experience a discharge of mucus from the rectum. And that concludes our online lecture for ostomy care. Again, um, it may be beneficial to look up uh, for sure NG tube care, but um, also ostomy and pouch care on your um, uh, uh, Smith, Duel, and Martin or the Taylor's um, skills book. Uh, thank you for your time.